In the Days of the Comet by H.G. Wells Narrated by Brian Godwin The world's great age begins anew, the golden years return. The earth doth like a snake renew, her winter skin outworn. Heaven smiles and faiths and empires gleam like wrecks of a dissolving dream. Prologue The Man Who Wrote in the Tower I saw a gray-haired man, a figure of hale age, sitting at a desk and writing. He seemed to be in a room in a tower, very high, so that through the tall window on his left one perceived only distances, a remote horizon of sea, a headland, and that vague haze and glitter in the sunset that many miles away marks a city. All the appointments of this room were orderly and beautiful, and in some subtle quality in this small difference in that, new to me and strange. They were in no fashion I could name, and the simple costume the man wore suggested neither period nor country. It might, I thought, be the happy future, or utopia, or the land of simple dreams, an errant moat of memory. Henry James's phrase and story of the great good place twinkled across my mind, and passed and left no light. The man I saw wrote with a thing like a fountain pen, a modern touch that prohibited any historical retrospection, and as he finished each sheet, writing in an easy-flowing hand, he added it to a growing pile upon a graceful little table under the window. His last done sheets lay loose, partly covering others that were clipped together into fascicles. Clearly he was unaware of my presence, and I stood waiting until his pen should come to a pause. Old as he certainly was, he wrote with a steady hand. I discovered that a concave speculum hung slatenly high over his head. A movement in this caught my attention sharply, and I looked up to see, distorted, and made fantastic but bright and beautifully colored, the magnified, reflected, evasive rendering of a palace, of a terrace, of the vista of a great roadway with many people, people exaggerated, impossible-looking because of the curvature of the mirror going to and fro. I turned my head quickly that I might see more clearly through the window behind me, but it was too high for me to survey this nearer scene directly, and after a momentary pause I came back to that distorting mirror again. But now the rider was leaning back in his chair. He put down his pen and sighed the half-resentful sigh. Ah, you! Work, you! How you gratify and tire me! of a man who has been writing to his satisfaction. What is this place, I asked, and who are you? He looked around with the quick movement of surprise. What is this place, I repeated, and where am I? He regarded me steadfastly for a moment under his wrinkled brows, and then his expression softened to a smile. He pointed to a chair beside the table. I am writing, he said. About this? About the change. I sat down. It was a very comfortable chair and well placed under the light. If you would like to read, he said. I indicated the manuscript. This explains, I asked. That explains, he answered. He drew a fresh sheet of paper toward him as he looked at me. I glanced from him about his apartment and back to the little table. A fascicle marked very distinctly, one, caught my attention, and I took it up. I smiled in his friendly eyes, very well, said I, suddenly at my ease, and he nodded and went on writing. And in a mood between confidence and curiosity, I began to read. And this is the story that happy, active-looking old man in that pleasant place had written. Book One, The Comet Chapter One, Dust in the Shadows Section One I have set myself to write the story of the great change, so far as it has affected my own life and the lives of one or two people closely connected me, primarily to please myself. Long ago in my crude, unhappy youth, I conceived the desire of writing a book. To scribble secretly and dream of authorship was one of my chief alleviations, and I read with a sympathetic envy every scrap I could get about the world of literature and the lives of literary people. It is something, even amidst this present happiness, to find leisure and opportunity to take up and partially realize these old and hopeless dreams. But that alone, in a world where so much of vivid and increasing interest presents itself to be done, even by an old man, would not, I think, suffice to set me at this desk. 
I find some such recapitulation of my past as this will involve is becoming necessary to my own secure mental continuity. The passage of years brings a man at last to retrospection. At 72, one's youth is far more important than it was at 40, and I am out of touch with my youth. The old life seems to cut off from the new, so alien and so unreasonable, that at times I find it bordering upon the incredible. The data have gone, the building in places. I stopped dead the other afternoon in my walk across the moor, where once the dismal outskirts of Swathinglia straggled toward Leet, and asked, was it here indeed that I crouched among the weeds and refuse and broke crockery and loaded my revolver ready for murder? Did ever such a thing happen in my life? Was such a mood and thought and intention ever possible to me? Rather, has not some queer nightmare spirit out of a dream lamp slipped into a pseudo-memory into the records of my vanished life? There must be many alive still who have the same perplexities, and I think too that those who are now growing up to take our places in the great enterprise of mankind will need many such narratives as mine for even the most partial conception of the old world of shadows that came before our day. It chances too that my case is fairly typical of the change. I was caught midway in a gust of passion, and a curious accident put me for a time in the very nucleus of the new order. My memory takes me back across the interval of fifty years to a little ill-lit room with a sash window open to a starry sky. And instantly there returns to me the characteristic smell of that room, the penetrating odor of an ill-trimmed lamp, burning cheap paraffin. Lighting by electricity had then been perfected for fifteen years, but still the larger portion of the world used these lamps. All this first scene will go, in my mind at least, to that olfactory accompaniment. That was the evening smell of the room. By day it had a more subtle aroma, a closeness, a peculiar sort of faint pungency that I associate, I know not why, with dust. Let me describe this room to you in detail. It was perhaps eight feet by seven feet in area, and rather high than either of these dimensions. The ceiling was of plaster, cracked and bulging in places, gray with the soot of the lamp, and in one place discolored by a system of yellow and olive-green stains caused by the percolation of damp from above. The walls were colored with dun-colored paper, upon which had been printed in oblique reiteration a crimson shape, something of the nature of a curly ostrich feather or an acanthus flower that had in its less faded moments a sort of dingy gaiety. There were several big plaster-rimmed wounds in this, caused by Parload's ineffectual attempts to get nails into the wall, whereby there might hang pictures. One nail had hit between two bricks and got home, and from this depended, sustained a little insecurely by frayed and knotted blind cord, Parload's hanging bookshelves, planks, painted over with a triacly blue enamel, and further decorated by a fringe of pink American cloth, insecurely fixed by tacks. Below this was a little table that behaved with a mulish vindictiveness to any knee that was thrust beneath it suddenly. It was covered with a cloth whose pattern of red and black had been rendered less monotonous by the accidents of Parload's versatile ink bottle, and on it, light motif of the whole stood and stank the lamp. This lamp, you must understand, was of some whitish, translucent substance that was neither china nor glass, and it had a shade of the same substance, a shade that did not protect the eyes of a reader in any measure, and it seemed admirably adapted to bring in pitiless prominence the fact that, after the lamp's trimming, dust and paraffin had been smeared over its exterior with a reckless generosity. The uneven floorboards of this apartment were covered with scratched enamel of chocolate hue, on which a small island of frayed carpet dimly blossomed in the dust and shadows. There was a very small grate, made of cast iron in one piece and painted buff, and a still smaller misfit of a cast iron fender that confessed the grey stone of the hearth. No fire was laid, only a few scraps of torn paper and the bowl of a broken corncob pipe were visible behind the bars, and in the corner, and rather thrust away, was an angular japanned coal box with a damaged hinge. It was the custom in those days to warm every room separately from a separate fireplace, more prolific of dirt than heat, and the rickety sash window, the small chimney, and the loose-fitting door were expected to organize the ventilation of the room among themselves without any further direction. 
Parload's truckle bed hid its gray sheets beneath an old patchwork counterpane on one side of the room, and veiled his boxes and such like oddments, and invading the two corners of the window were an old whatnot and the wash handstand, on which were distributed the simple appliances of his toilet. This wash handstand had been made of deal by someone with an excess of ternary appliances in a hurry who had tried to distract attention from the rough economies of his workmanship by an arresting ornamentation of blobs and bulbs upon the joints and legs. Apparently, the piece had then been placed in the hands of some person of infinite leisure, equipped with a pot of ochreous paint, varnish, and a set of flexible combs. This person had first painted the article, then, I fancy, smeared it with varnish, and then sat down to work with the combs to streak and comb the varnish into a weird imitation of the grain of some nightmare timber. The wash hand stand so made had evidently had a prolonged career of violent use, had been chipped, kicked, splintered, punched, stained, scorched, hammered, desiccated, damped, and defiled, had met indeed with almost every possible adventure except a conflagration or a scrubbing, until, at last, it had come to this high refuge of Parload's attic to sustain the simple requirements of Parload's personal cleanliness. There were, in chief, a basin and a jug of water, and a slop pail of ten, and further, a piece of yellow soap in a tray, a toothbrush, a rat-tailed shaving brush, one huckaback towel, and one or two other minor articles. In those days, only very prosperous people had more than such an equipage, and it is to be remarked that every drop of water Parload used had to be carried by an unfortunate servant girl, the Slavey. Parload called upon her, from her basement to the top of the house and subsequently down again. Already we forget how modern an invention is personal cleanliness. It is a fact that Parload never stripped for a swim in his life never had a simultaneous bath all over his body since his childhood, not one in fifty of us did in the days of which I am telling you. A chest, also singularly grained and streaked of two large and two small drawers, held Parload's reserve of garments, and pegs on the door carried his two hats, and completed his inventory of a bed sitting room. As I knew it before the change, but I had forgotten, there was also a chair with a squab that apologized inadequately for the defects of its cane seat. I forgot that for the moment, because I was sitting on the chair on the occasion that best begins this story, I have described Parload's room with such particularity, because it will help you understand the key in which my earlier chapters are written. But you must not imagine that the singular equipment or the smell of the lamp engaged my attention at that time to the slightest degree. I took all this grimy unpleasantness of it as if it were the most natural and proper setting for existence imaginable. It was the world as I knew it. My mind was entirely occupied then by graver and intenser matters, and it is only now in the distant retrospect that I see these details of environment as being remarkable, as significant, as indeed obviously the outward visible manifestations of the old world disorder in our hearts. Book 1, Section 2 Parload stood at the open window, opera glass in hand, and sought and found, and was uncertain about and lost again, the new comet. I thought the comet no more than a nuisance, but because I wanted to talk of other matters. But Parload was full of it. My head was hot. I was feverish with interlacing annoyances and bitterness. I wanted to open my heart to him. At least I wanted to relieve my heart by some romantic rendering of my troubles, and I gave but little heed to the things he told me. It was the first time I had heard of this new speck among the countless specks of heaven, and I did not care if I ever heard of the thing again. We were two youths, much of an age together. Parload was two and twenty, and eight months older than I. He was, I think, his proper definition was engrossing clerk. To the little solicitor in Overcastle, while I was third in the office staff at Rawdon's Pot Bank in Clayton. We had met first in the Parliament of the Young Men's Christian Association of Swathinglia. We had found we attended simultaneous classes in Overcastle, he in science and I in shorthand, and had started a practice of walking home together, and so our friendship came into being. Swathinglia, Clayton, and Overcastle were contiguous towns, I should mention, in the great industrial area of the Midlands. 
We had shared each other's secrets of religious doubt. We had confided to one another in common interest in socialism. He had come twice to supper at my mother's on a Sunday night, and I was free of his apartment. He was then a tall, flaxen-haired, gawky youth, with a disproportionate development of neck and wrist, and capable of vast enthusiasm. He gave two evenings a week to the evening classes of the organized science school in Overcastle. Physiography was his favorite subject, and through this insidious opening of his mind the wonder of outer space had come to take possession of his soul. He had commandeered an old opera glass from his uncle who farmed it leet over the moors. He had bought a cheap paper planisphere and Whitaker's almanac, and for a time day and moonlight were mere blank interruptions to the one satisfactory reality in his life stargazing. It was the deeps that had seized him, the immensities, and the mysterious possibilities that might float unlit in that unplumbed abyss, with infinite labor and the help of a very precise article in The Heavens, a little monthly magazine that catered for those who were under this obsession. He had at last got his opera glass upon the new visitor to our system from outer space, he gazed in a sort of rapture upon that quivering little smudge of light among the shining pinpoints, and gazed. My troubles had to wait for him. Wonderful, he sighed, and then, as though the first emphasis did not satisfy him, wonderful. He turned to me, wouldn't you like to see? I had to look, and then I had to listen. How that this scarce visible intruder was to be, was presently to be, one of the largest comets this world has ever seen. How that its course must bring it within that most, so many score of millions of miles from the earth, a mere step. Parload seemed to think that, how that spectroscope was already sounding its chemical secrets, perplexed by the unprecedented band in the green. How it was even now being photographed in the very act of unwinding in an unusual direction, a sunward tail which presently it wound up again. And all the while in a sort of undertow I was thinking first of Nettie Stewart, and the letter she had just written me, and then of old Rawdon's detestable face, as I had seen it that afternoon. Now I planned answers to Nettie, and now belated repartees to my employer, and then again Nettie was blazing all across the background of my thoughts. Nettie Stewart was the daughter of the head gardener, and of the rich Mr. Verrill's widow, and she and I had kissed and become sweethearts before we were eighteen years old. My mother and hers were second cousins and old schoolfellows, and though my mother had been widowed untimely by a train accident and had been reduced to letting lodgings, she was the Clayton curate's landlady, a position esteemed much lower than that of Mrs. Stewart, a kindly custom of occasional visits to the gardener's cottage at Checkhill Towers, still kept the friends in touch. Commonly I went with her, and I remember it was in the dusk of one bright evening in July, one of those long, golden evenings that do not give much way to night as admit at last. Upon courtesy, the moon and a choice retinue of stars that Nettie and I, at the pond of goldfish, where the yew-bordered walks converged, made our shy beginner's vow. I remember still, something will always stir me at that memory, the tremulous emotion of that adventure, Nettie was dressed in white, her hair went off in waves of soft darkness from above her dark shining eyes. There was a little necklace of pearls about her sweetly mottled neck, and a little coin of gold that nestled in her throat. I kissed her half-reluctant lips, and for three years of my life thereafter, nay, I almost think for all the rest of her life and mine, I could have died for her sake. You must understand, and every year it becomes increasingly difficult to understand, how entirely different the world was then from what it is now. It was a dark world, it was full of preventable disorder, preventable diseases, and preventable pain of harshness and stupid, unpremeditated cruelties. But yet, it may be even by virtue of the general darkness, there were moments of a rare and evanescent beauty that seemed no longer possible in my experience. The great change has come forevermore. Happiness and beauty are our atmosphere. There is peace on earth and goodwill to all men. None would dare to dream of returning to the sorrows of the former time, and yet that misery was pierced, ever and again its grey curtain was stabbed through and through by joys of an intensity, by perceptions of a keenness, that it seems to me are now altogether gone out of life. Is it the change, I wonder, that has robbed life of its extremes, or is it perhaps only this, that youth has left me? Even the strength of middle years leaves me now, and taken its despairs and raptures, leaving me judgment, perhaps sympathy, memories? I cannot tell. One would need to be young now, 
and have to be young then as well to decide that impossible problem. Perhaps a cool observer, even in the old days, would have found little beauty in our grouping. I have our two photographs at hand in this bureau as I write, and they show me a gawky youth in ill-fitting ready-made clothing, and Nettie, indeed Nettie, is badly dressed, and her attitude is more than a little stiff, but I can see her through the picture, and her living brightness and something of that mystery of charm she had had for me comes back again to my mind. Her face has triumphed over the photographer, or I would long ago have cast this picture away. The reality of beauty yields itself to no words. I wish that I had the sister art and could draw in my margins something that escapes description. There was a sort of gravity in her eyes. There was something, a matter of the minutest difference, about her upper lip, so that her mouth closed sweetly and broke very sweetly to a smile, that grave, sweet smile. After we had kissed and decided not to tell our parents for a while of the irrevocable choice we had made, the time came for us to part, shyly and before others, and I and my mother went off back across the moonlit park, the bracken thickets rustling with started deer, to the railway station at Checks Hill, and so to our dingy basement in Clayton, and I saw no more of Nettie, except that I saw her in my thoughts for nearly a year. But at our next meeting it was decided that we must correspond, and this we did with much elaboration of secrecy, for Nettie would have no one at home, not even her only sister, know of her attachment. So I had to send my precious documents sealed and undercover by way of a confidential schoolfellow of hers who lived near London. I could write that address down now, though house and street and suburb have gone beyond any man's tracing. Our correspondence began our estrangement, because for the first time we came into more than sensuous contact and our minds sought expression. You must understand that the world of thought in those days was in the strangest condition. It was choked with obsolete, inadequate formulae. It was torturous to a maze-like degree with secondary contravances and adaptations, suppressions, conventions, and subterfuges. Base immediacies fouled the truth on every man's lips. I was brought up by my mother in a quaint, old-fashioned, narrow faith in certain religious formulae, certain rules of conduct, certain conceptions of social and political order that had no more relevance to the realities and needs of everyday contemporary life than if they were clean linen that had been put away with lavender in a drawer. Indeed, her religion did actually smell of lavender. On Sundays, she always put away all the things of reality, the garments and even the furnishings of every day, hid her hands that were gnarled and sometimes chapped with scrubbing, in black, carefully mended gloves, assumed her old black silk dress and bonnet, and took me, unnaturally clean and sweet also, to church. There we sang and bowed and heard sonorous prayers and joined in sonorous responses, and rose with a congregational sigh refreshed and relieved when the doxology, with its opening now to God the Father, God the Son, bowed out the tame, brief sermon. There was a hell in that region of my mother's, a red-haired hell of curly flames that had once been very terrible, there was a devil, who was also ex officio, the British king's enemy, and much denunciation of the wicked lusts of the flesh. We were expected to believe that most of our poor, unhappy world was to atone for its muddle and trouble here by suffering exquisite torments forever after, world without end, amen. But indeed, those curly flames looked rather jolly. The whole thing had been mellowed and faded into a gentle unreality long before my time. If it had much terror, even in my childhood, I have forgotten it. It was not so terrible as the giant who was killed by the beanstalk. And I see it all now as a setting for my poor old mother's worn and grimy face, and almost lovingly as a part of her. And Mr. Gabidas, our plump little lodger, strangely transformed in his vestments and lifting his voice manfully to the quality of those Elizabethan prayers, seemed, I think, to give her a special and peculiar interest with God. She radiated her own tremulous gentleness upon him, and redeemed him from all the implications of vindictive theologians. She was in truth, had I but perceived it, the effectual answer to all she would have taught me. So I see it now, but there is something harsh in the earnest intensity of youth, and having at first taken all these things quite seriously, the fiery hell and God's vindictiveness at any neglect, as though they were as much a matter of fact as Bladden's iron works and Rodden's pot bank, I presently, with an equal seriousness, flung them out of my mind again. 
Mr. Gabadis, you see, did sometimes, as the phrase went, take notice of me. He had induced me to go on reading after I left school, and with the best intentions in the world and to anticipate the poison of the times, he had lent me Burble's skepticism answered, and drawn my attention to the library of the Institute in Clayton. The excellent Burble was a great shock to me. It seemed clear from his answers to the skeptic that the case for doctrinal orthodoxy, and all that faded and by no means awful hereafter, which I had hitherto accepted as I accepted the sun, was an extremely poor one, and to hammer home that idea the first book I got from the Institute happened to be an American edition of the collected works of Shelley, his gassy prose as well as his atmospheric verse. I was soon ripe for blatant unbelief, and at the Young Men's Christian Association I presently made the acquaintance of Parload, who told me, under promises of the most sinister secrecy, that he was a socialist out and out. He lent me several copies of a periodical with the clamant title of The Clarion, which was just taking up the crusade against the accepted religion. The adolescent years of any fairly intelligent youth lie open, and will always lie healthily open, to the contagion of philosophical doubts, of scorns and new ideas, and I will confess I had the fever of that phase badly. Doubt, I say, but it was not so much doubt, which is a complex thing, as startled emphatic denial. Have I believed this? And I was also, you must remember, just beginning love letters to Nettie. We live now in these days when the great change has been in most things accomplished, in a time when everyone is being educated to a sort of intellectual gentleness, a gentleness that abates nothing from our vigor. And it is hard to understand the stifled and struggling manner in which my generation of common young men did its thinking. To think at all about certain questions was an act of rebellion that set one oscillating between the furtive and the defiant. People begin to find Shelley, for all his melody, Noisy and ill-conditioned now, because his anarchs have vanished, yet there was a time when novel thought had to go to that tune of breaking glass. It becomes a little difficult to imagine the yeasty state of mind, the disposition to shout and say, yeah, at constituted authority, to sustain a persistent note of provocation such as we raw youngsters displayed. I began to read with avidity such writing as Carlyle, Browning, and Hine have left for the perplexity of posterity, and not only to read and admire, but to imitate. My letters to Nettie, after one or two genuinely intended displays of perfervid tenderness, broke out toward theology, sociology, and the cosmos in turgid and startling expressions. No doubt they puzzled her extremely. I retained the keenest sympathy and something inexplicably near to envy for my own departed youth, but should I find it difficult to maintain my case against anyone who would condemn me altogether as having been very silly, posturing, emotionally hobbledy hoy indeed, and quite like my faded photograph? And when I tried to recall what exactly must have been the quality and tenor of my more sustained efforts to write memorably to my sweetheart, I confess I shiver, yet I wish they were not all destroyed." Her letters to me were simple enough, written in a roundish, unformed hand and badly phrased. Her first two or three showed a shy pleasure in the use of the word dear, and I remember being first puzzled, and then when I understood, delighted, because she had written Willie Astor under my name. Astor, I gathered, meant darling, but when the evidence of my fermentation began, her answers were less happy. I will not weary you with the story of how we quarreled in our silly youthful way, and how I went the next Sunday all uninvited to Chex Hill and made it worse, and how afterward I wrote a letter that she thought was lovely and mended the matter. Nor will I tell of our subsequent fluctuations of misunderstanding. Always I was the offender and the final penitent until this last trouble that was now beginning. And in between we had some tender near moments, and I loved her very greatly." There was this misfortune in the business, that in the darkness and alone, I thought with great intensity of her, of her eyes, of her touch, of her sweet and delightful presence. But when I sat down to write, I thought of Shelley and Burns and myself, and such irrelevant matters. When one is in love in this fermenting way, it is harder to make love than it is when one does not love at all. And as for Nettie, she loved, I know, not me, but those gentle mysteries— it was not my voice should arouse her dreams to passion, so our letters continued to jar. Then suddenly she wrote me, one doubting whether she could ever care for anyone who was a socialist and did not believe in church, 
and then hard upon it came another note with unexpected novelties of phrasing. She thought we were not suited to each other. We differed so in tastes and ideas. She had long thought of releasing me from our engagement. In fact, though I really did not apprehend it fully at the first shock, I was dismissed. Her letter had reached me when I had come home after old Rawdon's none-too-civil refusal to raise my wages. On this particular evening of which I write, therefore, I was in a state of feverish adjustment to two new and amazing, two nearly overwhelming facts that I was neither indispensable to Nettie nor at Rawdon's, and to talk of comets. Where did I stand? I had grown so accustomed to think of Nettie as inseparably mine— the whole tradition of true love pointed me to that, that for her face, about these precise small phrases toward abandonment, after we had kissed and whispered and come so close in the little adventurous familiarities of the young, shocked me profoundly. I, I, and Rawdon didn't find me indispensable either. I felt I was suddenly repudiated by the universe and threatened with effacement, that in some positive and emphatic way I must at once assert myself. There was no balm in the religion I had learnt, or in the irreligion I had adopted, for wounded self-love. Should I fling up Rawdon's place at once, and then in some extraordinary swift manner make the fortune of Frobisher's adjacent and closely competitive pot bank? The first part of that program, at any rate, would be easy of accomplishment, to go to Rawdon and say, you will hear from me again, but for the rest, Frobisher might fail me. That, however, was a secondary issue. The predominant affair was with Nettie. I found my mind thick shot with flying fragments of rhetoric that might be of service in the letter I would write her. Scorn, irony, tenderness, what was it to be? Brother, said Parload suddenly. What, said I? They're firing up Bladden's ironworks and the smoke comes right across my bit of sky. The interruption came just as I was ripe to discharge my thoughts upon him. Parload, said I, very likely I shall have to leave all this. Old Rawdon won't give me a rise in my wages, and after having asked, I don't think I can stand going upon the old terms any more. See? So I may have to clear out of Clayton for good and all. Book 1, Chapter 1, Section 3 That made Parload put down the opera glass and look at me. It's a bad time to change just now, he said after a little pause. Rawdon had said as much in a less agreeable tone, but with Parload I always felt a disposition to the heroic note. I'm tired, I said, of humdrum drudgery for other men. One may as well starve one's body out of a place as to starve one's soul in one. I don't know about that altogether, began Parload slowly. And with that, we began one of our interminable conversations, one of those wandering, intensely generalizing, diffusely personal talks that will be dear to the hearts of intelligent youths until the world comes to an end. The change has not abolished that, anyhow. It would be an incredible feat of memory for me now to recall all that meandering haze of words. Indeed, I recall scarcely any of it, though its circumstances and atmosphere stand out, a sharp, clear picture in my mind. I posed after my manner, and behaved very foolishly, no doubt, a wounded, smarting egotist, and Parload played his part of the philosopher preoccupied with the deeps. We were presently abroad, walking through the warm summer's night and talking all the more freely for that. But one thing that I can say I can remember, I wish at times, said I, with a gesture at the heavens, that comet of yours or some such thing would indeed strike this world, and wipe us all away, strikes, wars, tumults, loves, jealousies, and all the wretchedness of life. Ah, said Parload, and the thought seemed to hang about him. It could only add to the miseries of life, he said irrelevantly. When presently I was discoursing of other things, what would? Collision with a comet. It would only throw things back. It would only make what was left of life more savage than it is at present. But why should anything be left of life, said I? That was our style, you know. And meanwhile, we walked together up the narrow street outside his lodging, up the stepway and the lanes toward Clayton Crest and the high road. But my memories carry me back so effectually to those days before the change that I forget that now all these places have been altered beyond recognition, that the narrow street and the stepway and the view from Clayton Crest, 
and indeed all the world in which I was born and bred and made has vanished clean away, out of space and out of time, and well nigh out of the imagination of all those who are younger by a generation than I. You cannot see, as I can see, the dark empty way between the mean houses, the dark empty way lit by a bleary gas lamp at the corner. You cannot feel the hard checkered pavement under your boots. You cannot mark the dimly lit windows here and there, and the shadows upon the ugly and often patched and crooked blinds of the people cooped within. Nor can you presently pass the beer house with its brighter gas and its queer screening windows, nor get a whiff of foul air and foul language from its door. Nor see the crumpled, furtive figure, some rascal child that slinks past us down the steps. We cross the longer street, up which a clumsy steam tram, vomiting smoke and sparks, made its clangorous way, and adown which one saw the greasy brilliance of shop fronts and naphtha flares of hawkers' barrows dripping fire into the night. A hazy movement of people swayed along that road, and we heard the voice of an itinerant preacher from a waste place between the houses. You cannot see these things as I can see them, nor can you figure unless you know the pictures that great artist Hyde has left the world. The effect of the great hoarding by which we passed, lit below by a gas lamp and towering up to a sudden sharp black edge against the pallid sky. Those hoardings, they were the brightest colored things in all that vanished world. Upon them in its successive layers of paste and paper, all the rough enterprises of that time joined in chromatic discord, pill vendors and preachers, theaters and charities, Marvelous soaps and astonishing pickles, typewriting machines and sewing machines, mingled in a sort of visualized clamor. And passing that there was a muddy lane of cinders, a lane without a light, that used its many puddles to borrow a star or so from the sky. We splashed along unheeding as we talked. Then across the allotments a wilderness of cabbages and evil-looking sheds, past a gaunt abandoned factory, and so to the high road. The high road ascended in a curve past a few houses, and a beer house or so, and round until all the valley in which four industrial towns lay crowded and confluent was overlooked. I will admit that the twilight there came a spell of weird magnificence over all that land and brooded on until dawn. The horrible meanness of its details was veiled, the hutches that were homes, the bristling multitudes of chimneys, the ugly patches of unwilling vegetation, amidst the makeshift fences of barrel stave and wire. The rusty scars that framed the opposite ridges where the iron ore was taken and the barren mountains of slag from the blast furnaces were veiled. The reek and boiling smoke and dust from foundry, pot bank and furnace, transfigured and assimilated by the night. The dust-laden atmosphere that was grey oppression through the day became at sundown a mystery of deep translucent colors of blues and purples, of somber and vivid reds, of strange bright clearnesses of green and yellow athwart the darkling sky. Each upstart furnace, when its monarch sun had gone, crowned itself with flames, the dark cinder heaps began to glow with quivering fires, and each pot bank squatted rebellious in a volcanic coronet of light. The empire of the day broke into a thousand feudal baronies of burning coal, the minor streets across the valley picked themselves out with gas lamps of faint yellow that brightened and mingled at the all-principal squares and crossings with the greenish pallor of incandescent mantles and the high cold glare of the electric arc. The interlacing railways lifted bright signal boxes over their intersections and signal stars of red and green in rectangular constellations. The trains became articulated black serpents breathing fire. Moreover, high overhead, like a thing put out of reach and near forgotten, Parload had rediscovered a realm that was ruled by neither sun nor furnace, the universe of stars. This was the scene of many a talk we two had held together, and if in the daytime we went right over the crest and looked westward, there was farmland, there were parks and great mansions, the spire of a distant cathedral, and sometimes, when the weather was near raining, the crests of remote mountains hung clearly in the sky. Beyond the range of sight, indeed, out beyond, there was Chexhill. I felt it there always, and in the darkness more than I did by day, Chexhill and Nettie. And to us two youngsters, as we walked along the cinder path beside the rutted road and argued out our perplexities, 
it seemed that this ridge gave us compendiously a view of our whole world. There on the one hand, in a crowded darkness, about the ugly factories and workplaces, the workers herded together, ill-clothed, ill-nourished, ill-taught, badly and expensively served at every occasion in life, uncertain even of their insufficient livelihood from day to day, to chapels and churches and public houses swelling up amidst their wretched homes like saprophytes amidst a general corruption, and on the other, in space, freedom and dignity, scarce heeding the few cottages as overcrowded as they were picturesque, in which the laborers festered, lived the landlords and masters who owned pot banks and forge and farm and mine. Far away, distant, beautiful, irrelevant, from out of the little cluster of second-hand bookshops, ecclesiastical residences and the inns and incidentals of a decaying market town, the cathedral of Lowchester pointed a beautiful, unemphatic spire to vague, incredible skies. So it seemed to us that the whole world was planned in those youthful first impressions. We saw everything simple, as young men will. We had our angry, confident solutions, and whosoever would criticize them was a friend of the robbers. And it was a clear case of robbery, we held visibly so. There in those great houses lurked the landlord, the capitalist, with his scoundrel the lawyer, with his cheat the priest, and we others were all the victims of their deliberate villainies. No doubt they winked and chuckled over their rare wines amidst their dazzling, wickedly dressed women, and plotted further grinding for the faces of the poor. And amidst all the squalor, on the other hand, amidst brutalities, ignorance, and drunkenness, suffered multitudinously their blameless victim, the working man. And we, almost at the first glance, had found all this out. It had merely to be asserted now with sufficient rhetoric and vehemence to change the face of the whole world. The working man would arise in the form of a labor party, and with young men like Parload and myself to represent him and come to his own, and then? Then the robbers would get it hot, and everything would be extremely satisfactory. Unless my memory plays me strange tricks, that does no injustice to the creed of thought and action that Parload and I held as the final result of human wisdom. We believed it with heat, and rejected with heat the most obvious qualification of its harshness. At times in our great talks, we were full of heady hopes for the near triumph of our doctrine. More often, our mood was hot resentment at the wickedness and stupidity that delayed so plain and simple a reconstruction of the order of the world. Then we grew malignant, and thought of barricades and significant violence. I was very bitter, I know, upon this night of which I am now particularly telling, and the only face upon the hydra of capitalism and monopoly that I could see it all clearly, smiled exactly as old Rodden had smiled when he refused to give me more than a paltry twenty shillings a week. I wanted intensely to solve my self-respect by some revenge upon him, and I felt that if that could be done by slaying the hydra, I might drag its carcass to the feet of Nettie and settle my other trouble as well. What do you think of me now, Nettie? That at any rate comes near enough to the quality of my thinking, then for you to imagine how I gesticulated and spouted to Parlot that night. You figure us as little black figures, unprepossessing in the outline, set in the midst of that desolating night of flaming industrialism, and my little voice with a rhetorical twang, protesting, denouncing. You will consider those notions of my youth, poor, silly, violent stuff, particularly if you are of the younger generation born since the change, you will be of that opinion. Nowadays, the whole world thinks clearly, thinks with deliberation, pellucid certainties. You find it impossible to imagine how any other thinking could have been possible. Let me tell you then, how you can bring yourself to something like the condition of our former state. In the first place, you must get yourself out of health by unwise drinking and eating, and out of condition by neglecting your exercise. Then you must contrive to be worried very much and made very anxious and uncomfortable. And then you must work very hard for four or five days and for long hours every day at something too petty to be interesting, too complex to be mechanical, and without any personal significance to you whatever. This done, get straight away into a room that is not ventilated at all, 
and that is already full of foul air. And there, set yourself to think out some very complicated problem. In a very little while, you will find yourself in a state of intellectual muddle, annoyed, impatient, snatching at the obvious, presently in choosing and rejecting conclusions haphazard. Try to play chess under such conditions and you will play stupidly and lose your temper. Try to do anything that taxes the brain or temper and you will fail. Now the whole world before the change was as sick and feverish as that. It was worried and overworked and perplexed by problems that would not get stated simply, that changed and evaded the solution. It was in an atmosphere that had corrupted and thickened past breathing. There was no thorough, cool thinking in the world at all. There was nothing in the mind of the world anywhere but half-truths, hasty assumptions, hallucinations and emotions. Nothing. I know it seems incredible that already some of the younger men are beginning to doubt the greatness of the change our world has undergone. But read, read the newspapers of that time. Every age becomes mitigated and a little ennobled in our minds as it recedes into the past. It is the part of those who, like myself, have stories of that time to tell, to supply, by a scrupulous spiritual realism, some antidote to that glamour. Book 1, Chapter 1, Section 4 Always with Parload, I was the chief talker. I can look back upon myself with, I believe, an almost perfect detachment. Things have so changed that indeed now I am another being, with scarce anything in common with that boastful, foolish youngster whose troubles I recall. I see him vulgarly theatrical, egotistical, insincere. Indeed, I do not like him, save with that instinctive material sympathy that is the fruit of incessant intimacy. Because he was myself, I may be able to feel and write understandingly about motives that will put him out of sympathy with nearly every reader, but why should I palliate or defend his quality? Always, I say, I did the talking, and it would have amazed me beyond measure if anyone had told me that mine was not the greater intelligence in these wordy encounters. Parload was a quiet youth, and stiff and restrained in all things, while I had that supreme gift for young men and democracies, the gift of copious expression. Parload, I diagnosed in my secret heart as a trifle dull, he posed as pregnant quiet, I thought, and was obsessed by the congenial notion of scientific caution. I did not remark that while my hands were chiefly useful for gesticulation or holding a pen, Parload's hands could do all sorts of things, and I do not think, therefore, that fibers must run from those fingers to something in his brain. Nor, though I bragged perpetually of my short hand, of my literature, of my indispensable share in Rodden's business, did Parload lay stress on the conics and calculus he mugged in that organized science school? Parload is a famous man now, a great figure in a great time. His work upon intersecting radiations has broadened the intellectual horizon of mankind forever, and I, who am at best a hewer of intellectual wood, a drawer of living water, can smile, and he can smile, to think how I patronized and posed and jabbered over him in the darkness of those early days. That night I was shrill and eloquent beyond measure. Rawdon was, of course, the hub upon which I went round. Rawdon and Rawdonesque employer, the injustice of wages slavery, and all immediate conditions of that industrial blind alley up which it seemed our lives were thrust. But ever and again I glanced at other things. Nettie was always there in the background of my mind, regarding me enigmatically. It was part of my pose to Parload that I had a romantic love affair somewhere away beyond the sphere of our intercourse, and that note gave a Byronic resonance to many of the nonsensical things I produced for his astonishment. I will not weary you with too detailed an account of the talk of a foolish youth who was also distressed and unhappy, and whose vice was balm for the humiliations that smarted in his eyes. Indeed, now in many particulars I cannot disentangle this harangue of which I tell from many of the things I have said in other talks to Parload. For example, I forget if it was then or before or afterwards that, as it were by accident, I let out what might be taken as an admission that I was addicted to drugs. You shouldn't do that, said Parload suddenly. It won't do to poison your brains with that. My brains, my eloquence, 
were to be very important assets to our party in the coming revolution. But one thing does clearly belong to this particular conversation I am recalling. When I started out, it was quite settled in the back of my mind that I must not leave Rodden's. I simply wanted to abuse my employer to parload. But I talked myself quite out of touch with all the cogent reasons there were for sticking to my place, and I got home that night irrevocably committed to a spirited, not to say a defiant, policy with my employer. I can't stand Rodden's much longer, I said to Parload by way of a flourish. There's hard times coming, said Parload. Next winter. Sooner. The Americans have been overproducing, and they mean to dump. The iron trade is going to have convulsions. I don't care. Pot banks are steady. With a corner in borax. No, I've heard... What have you heard? Office secrets. But it's no secret there's trouble coming to potters. There's been borrowing and speculation. The masters don't stick to one business as they used to do. I can tell that much. Half the valley may be playing before two months are out. Parlo delivered himself of this unusually long speech in his most pithy and weighty manner. Playing was our local euphemism for a time when there was no work and no money for a man, a time of stagnation and dreary, hungry, loafing day after day. Such interludes seemed in those days a necessary consequence of industrial organization. You'd better stick to Rodden's, said Parload. Ugh, said I, affecting a noble disgust. There'll be trouble, said Parload. Who cares, said I. Let there be trouble, the more the better. This system has got to end sooner or later. These capitalists, with their speculation and corners and trusts, make things go from bad to worse. Why should I cower in Rodden's office like a frightened dog while hunger walks the streets? Hunger is the master revolutionary. When he comes, we ought to turn out and salute him. Anyway, I'm going to do so now. That's all very well, began Parload. I'm tired of it, said I. I want to come to grips with all these Roddens. I think perhaps if I was hungry and savage, I could talk to hungry men. There's your mother, said Parload, in his slow judicial way. That was a difficulty. I got over it by a rhetorical turn. Why should one sacrifice the future of the world? Why should one even sacrifice one's own future? Because one's mother is totally destitute of imagination? Book 1, Chapter 1, Section 5 It was late when I parted from Parload and came back to my own home. Our house stood in a highly respectable little square near the Clayton Parish Church. Mr. Gabitas, the curate of all work, lodged on our ground floor, and upstairs there was an old lady, Miss Holroyd, who painted flowers on china and maintained her blind sister in an adjacent room. My mother and I lived in the basement and slept in the attics. The front of the house was veiled by a Virginia creeper that defied the Clayton air and clustered in untidy, dependent masses over the wooden porch. As I came up the steps, I had a glimpse of Mr. Gabitas printing photographs by candlelight in his room. It was the chief delight of his little life to spend his holiday abroad in the company of a queer little snapshot camera and to return with a great multitude of foggy and sinister negatives that he had made in beautiful and interesting places. These the camera company would develop for him on advantageous terms, and he would spend his evenings the year through in printing them in order to inflict copies upon his undeserving friends. There was a long frameful of his work in the Clayton National School, for example, inscribed in Old English lettering, Italian Travel Pictures, by the Reverend E. B. Gabitas. For this, it seemed he lived and traveled and had his being. It was really his only joy. By his shaded light, I could see his sharp little nose, his little pale eyes behind his glasses, his mouth pursed up with the endeavor of his employment. Hireling liar, I muttered, for was not he also part of the system, part of the scheme of robbery that made wages serfs of Parload and me? though his share in the proceedings was certainly small. Hireling liar, said I, standing in the darkness, outside even his faint glow of traveled culture. My mother let me in. She looked at me mutely, because she knew there was something wrong and that it was no use for her to ask what. Good night, mummy. 
said I, and kissed her a little roughly, and lit and took my candle and went off at once up the staircase to bed, not looking back at her. I've kept some supper for you, dear. Don't want any supper. But dearie. Good night, mother. And I went up and slammed my door upon her, blew out my candle, and lay down at once upon my bed. Lay there a long time before I got up to undress. There were times when that dumb beseeching of my mother's face irritated me unspeakably. It did so that night. I felt I had to struggle against it, that I could not exist if I gave way to its pleadings, and it hurt me and divided me to resist it almost beyond endurance. It was clear to me that I had to think out myself for religious problems, social problems, questions of conduct, questions of expediency, that her poor, dear, simple beliefs could not help me at all and she did not understand. Hers was the accepted religion. Her only social ideas were blind submissions to the accepted orders, to laws, to doctors, clergymen, lawyers, masters, and all respectable persons in authority over us, and with her to believe was to fear. She knew from a thousand little signs, though still at times I went to church with her, that I was passing out of touch of all these things that ruled her life into some terrible unknown. From things I said she could infer such clumsy concealments as I made, she felt my socialism, felt my spirit and revolt against the accepted order, felt the impotent resentments that filled me with bitterness against all she held sacred. Yet you know it was not her dear gods she sought to defend so much as me. She seemed always to be wanting to say to me, Dear, I know it's hard, but revolt is harder. Don't make war on it, dear, don't. Don't do anything to offend it. I'm sure it will hurt you if you do. It will hurt you if you do. She had been cowed into submission, as so many women of that time had been, by the sheer brutality of the accepted thing. The existing order dominated her into a worship of abject observances. It had bent her, aged her, robbed her of eyesight, so that at fifty-five she peered through cheap spectacles at my face, and saw it only dimly, filled her with a habit of anxiety, made her hands her poor dear hands, not in the whole world now could you find a woman with hands so grimy, so needle-worn, so misshapen by toil, so chapped and coarsened, so evilly entreated. At any rate, there is this I can say for myself, that my bitterness against the world and fortune was for her sake as well as for my own. Yet that night I pushed by her harshly, I answered her curtly, left her concerned and perplexed in the passage, and slammed my door upon her. And for a long time I lay raging at the hardship and evil of life, at the contempt of Rawdon, and the loveless coolness of Nettie's letter, at my weakness and insignificance, at the things I found intolerable and the things I could not mend. Over and over went my poor little brain, tired out and unable to stop on my treadmill of troubles. Nettie, Rawdon, my mother, Gabitas, Nettie. Suddenly, I came upon emotional exhaustion. Some clock was striking midnight. After all, I was young. I had these quick transitions. I remember quite distinctly. I stood up abruptly, undressed very quickly in the dark, and had hardly touched my pillow again before I was asleep. But how my mother slept that night, I do not know. Oddly enough, I do not blame myself for behaving like this to my mother, though my conscience blames me acutely for my arrogance to Parload. I regret my behavior to my mother before the days of the change. It is a scar among my memories that will always be a little painful to the end of my days, but I do not see how something of the sort was to be escaped under those former conditions. In that time of muddle and obscurity, people were overtaken by needs and toil and hot passions before they had a chance of even a year or so of clear thinking. They settled down to an intense and strenuous application to some partial but immediate duty, and the growth of thought seized in them. They set and hardened into narrow ways. Few women remained capable of a new idea after five and twenty, few men after thirty-one or two. Discontent with the thing that existed was regarded as immoral. It was certainly an annoyance, and the only protest against it, the only effort against that universal tendency in all human institutions to thicken and clog, to work loosely and badly, to rust and weaken toward catastrophes, came from the young, the crude, unmerciful young. 
It seemed in those days to thoughtful men the harsh law of being, that either we must submit to our elders and be stifled, or disregard them, disobey them, thrust them aside, and make our little step of progress before we too ossified and became obstructive in our turn. My pushing past my mother, my irresponsive departure to my own silent meditations, was, I now perceive, a figure of the whole hard relationship between parents and son in those days. There appeared no other way. That perpetually recurring tragedy was, it seemed, part of the very nature of the progress of the world. We did not think then that minds might grow ripe without growing rigid, or children honor their parents and still think for themselves. We were angry and hasty because we stifled in the darkness, in a poisoned and vitiated air. That deliberate animation of the intelligence which is now the universal quality, that vigor with consideration, that judgment with confident enterprise which shine through all the world, were things disintegrated and unknown in the corrupting atmosphere of our former state. So the first fascicle ended, I put it aside and looked for the second. Well, said the man who wrote, this is fiction? It's my story. But you, amidst this beauty, you are not this ill-conditioned, squalidly bred lad of whom I have been reading? He smiled. There intervenes a certain change, he said. Have I not hinted at that? I hesitated upon a question, then saw the second fascicle at hand and picked it up. Book 1, Chapter 2, Nettie, Section 1 I cannot now remember, the story resumed, what interval separated that evening on which Parload first showed me the comet. I think I only pretended to see it then, and the Sunday afternoon I spent at Chex Hill. Between the two there was time enough for me to give notice and leave Rodden's, to seek for some other situation, very strenuously in vain, to think and say many hard and violent things to my mother and to Parload, and to pass through some phases of very profound wretchedness. There must have been a passionate correspondence with Nettie, but all the froth and fury of that has faded now out of my memory. All I have clear now is that I wrote one magnificent farewell to her, casting her off forever, and that I got in reply a prim little note to say that even if there was to be an end to everything, that was no excuse for writing such things as I had done, and then I think I wrote again in a vein I considered satirical. To that she did not reply. That interval was at least three weeks, and probably four, because the comet, which had been on the first occasion only a dubious speck in the sky, certainly visible only when it was magnified, was now a great white presence, brighter than Jupiter, and casting a shadow on its own account. It was now actively present in the world of human thought. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone was looking for its waxing splendor. As the sun went down, the papers, the music halls, the hoardings echoed it. Yes, the comet was already dominant before I went over to make everything clear to Nettie, and Parload had spent two hoarded pounds in buying himself a spectroscope, so that he could see for himself, night after night, that mysterious, that stimulating line, the unknown line in the green. How many times, I wonder, did I look at that smudgy, quivering symbol of the unknown things that were rushing upon us out of the inhuman void before I rebelled? Yet at last I could stand it no longer and I reproached Parload very bitterly for wasting his time in astronomical dilettantism. Here, said I, we're on the verge of the biggest lockout in the history of this countryside. Here's distress and hunger coming. Here's all the capitalistic competitive system like a wound inflamed, and you spend your time gaping at that damn silly streak of nothing in the sky. Parload stared at me. Yes, I do, he said slowly, as though it was a new idea. Don't I? I wonder why. I want to start meetings of an evening on Howden's Waste. You think they'd listen? They'd listen fast enough now. They didn't before, said Parload, looking at his pet instrument. There was a demonstration of unemployed at Swathing Leah on Sunday. They got to stone throwing. Parload said nothing for a little while, and I said several things. He seemed to be considering something. But after all, he said at last, with an awkward movement towards his spectroscope, that does signify something. The comet? Yes. What can it signify? You don't want me to believe in astrology. What does it matter what flames in the heavens when men are starving on earth? 
It's, it's science. Science. What we want now is socialism, not science. He still seemed reluctant to give up his comment. Socialism's all right, he said. But if that thing up there was to hit the earth, it might matter. Nothing matters but human beings. Suppose it killed them all. Oh, said I, that's rot. I wonder, said Parload, dreadfully divided in his allegiance. He looked at the comet. He seemed on the verge of repeating his growing information about the nearness of the paths of the earth and comet and all that might ensue from it. So I cut in with something I had got out of the now-forgotten writer called Ruskin, a volcano of beautiful language and nonsensical suggestions, who prevailed very greatly with eloquent, excitable young men in these days. Something it was about the insignificance of science and supreme importance of life. Parload stood listening, half-turned toward the sky with the tips of his fingers on his spectroscope. He seemed to come to a sudden decision. No, I don't agree with you, Ledford, he said. You don't understand about science. Parload rarely argued with that bluntness of opposition. I was so used to entire possession of our talk that his brief contradiction struck me like a blow. Don't agree with me, I repeated. No, said Parload. But how? I believe science is of more importance than socialism, he said. Socialism's a theory. Science? Science is something more. That was really all he seemed to be able to say. We embarked upon one of those queer arguments illiterate young men used always to find so heating, science or socialism. It was, of course, like arguing which is right, left-handedness or a taste for onions. It was altogether impossible opposition. But the rage of my rhetoric enabled me to at last exasperate Parload, and his mere repudiation of my conclusions sufficed to exasperate me, and we ended in the key of a positive quarrel. Oh, very well, said I, so long as I know where we are. I slammed his door as though I dynamited his house, and went raging down the street. But I felt that he was already back at the window, worshipping his blessed line in the green before I got round the corner. I had to walk for an hour or so before I was cool enough to go home, and it was Parload who had first introduced me to socialism. Recreant. The most extraordinary things used to run through my head in those days. I will confess that my mind ran persistently that evening upon revolutions after the best French pattern, and I sat on a committee of safety and tried backsliders. Parload was there, among the prisoners, black sliderismus, aware too late of the error of his ways. His hands were tied behind his back, ready for the shambles. Through the open door, one heard the voice of justice, the rude justice of the people. I was sorry, but I had to do my duty. If we punish those who would betray us to kings, said I, with a sorrowful deliberation, how much the more we must punish those who would give over the state to the pursuit of useless knowledge. And so, with a gloomy satisfaction, sent him off to the guillotine. Ah, parload, parload! If only you'd listened to me earlier, Parload. Nonetheless, that quarrel made me extremely happy. Parload was my only gossip, and it cost me much to keep him away and think evil of him with no one to listen to me evening after evening. That was a very miserable time for me, even before my last visit to Chexhill. My long, unemployed hours hung heavily on my hands. I kept away from home all day, partly to support a fiction that I was sedulously seeking another situation, and partly to escape the persistent question in my mother's eyes. Why did you quarrel with Mr. Rodden? Why did you? Why do you keep on going about with a sullen face and risk offending it more? I spent most of the morning in the newspaper room of the public library, writing impossible applications for impossible posts. I remember that among other things of the sort, I offered my services to a firm of private detectives, a sinister breed of traitors upon base jealousies now happily vanished from the world, and wrote a propos of an advertisement for Stevedorus, that I did not know what the duties of a stevedore might be, but that I was apt and willing to learn. And in the afternoons and evenings, I wandered through the strange lights and shadows of my native valley and hated all created things until my wanderings were checked by the discovery that I was wearing out my boots. The stagnant, inconclusive malaria of that time. I perceived that I was an evil-tempered, ill-disposed youth with a great capacity for hatred, but there was an excuse for hate. It was wrong of me to hate individuals, to be rude, harsh, and vindictive to this person or that, 
But indeed, it would have been equally wrong to have taken the manifest offer life had made me without resentment. I see now clearly and calmly what I then felt obscurely and with an unbalanced intensity that my conditions were intolerable. My work was tedious and laborious, and it took up an unreasonable proportion of my time. I was ill-clothed, ill-fed, ill-housed, ill-educated, and ill-trained. My will was suppressed and cramped to the pitch of torture. I had no reasonable pride in myself, and no reasonable chance of putting anything right. It was a life hardly worth living, that a large proportion of the people about me had no better a lot, that many had a worse, does not affect these facts. It was a life in which contentment would have been disgraceful, if some of them were contented or resigned, so much the worse for everyone. No doubt, it was hasty and foolish of me to throw up my situation, but everything was so obviously aimless and foolish in our social organization that I do not feel disposed to blame myself even for that, except in so far as it pained my mother and caused her anxiety. Think of the one comprehensive fact of the lockout. That year was a bad year, a year of worldwide economic disorganization. Through their want of intelligent direction, the great trust of American ironmasters, a gang of energetic, narrow-minded furnace owners, had smelted far more iron than the whole world had any demand for. In those days, there existed no means of estimating any need of that sort beforehand. They had done this without even consulting the ironmasters of any other country. During their period of activity, they had drawn into their employment a great number of workers and had erected a huge productive plant. It is manifestly just that people who do headlong stupid things of this sort should suffer. But in the old days, it was quite possible, it was customary for the real blunderers in such disasters, to shift nearly all the consequences of their incapacity. No one thought it wrong for a light-witted captain of industry who had led his workpeople into overproduction, into the disproportionate manufacture, that is to say, of some particular article, to abandon and dismiss them. Nor was there anything to prevent the sudden frantic underselling of some trade rival in order to surprise and destroy his trade, secure his customers for one's own destined needs, and shift a portion of one's punishment upon him. This operation of spasmodic underselling was known as dumping, the American ironmasters were now dumping on the British market. The British employers were, of course, taking their loss out of the workpeople as much as possible. But in addition, they were agitating for some legislation that would prevent not stupid relative excess in production, but dumping. Not the disease, but the consequences of the disease. The necessary knowledge to prevent either dumping or its causes, the uncorrelated production of commodities, did not exist. But this hardly weighed with them at all, and in answer to their demands, they had arisen a curious party of retaliatory protectionists who combined vague proposals for spasmodic responses to these convulsive attacks from foreign manufacturers, with the very evident intention of achieving financial adventures. The dishonest and reckless elements were indeed so evident in this movement as to add very greatly to the general atmosphere of distrust and insecurity. And in the recoil from the prospect of fiscal power in the hands of the class of men known as the new financiers, one heard frightened old-fashioned statesmen asserting with passion that dumping didn't occur, or that it was a very charming sort of thing to happen. Nobody would face and handle the rather intricate truth of the business. The whole effect of the mind of a cool observer was of a covoy of unsubstantial jabbering minds drifting over a series of irrational economic cataclysms, prices, and employment tumbled about like towers in an earthquake, and amidst the shifting masses were the common workpeople going on with their lives as well as they could, suffering perplexed, unorganized, and, for anything but violent, fruitless protests impotent. You cannot hope to understand the infinite want of adjustment in the old order of things. At one time, there were people dying of actual starvation in India, while men were burning unsaleable wheat in America. It sounds like the account of a particularly mad dream, does it not? It was a dream, a dream from which no one on earth expected an awakening. To us youngsters, with the positiveness, the rationalization of youth, it seemed that the strikes and lockouts, the overproduction and misery could not possibly result simply from ignorance and want of thought and feeling. We needed more dramatic factors than these mental fogs, these mere atmospheric devils. 
We fled, therefore, to that common refuge of the unhappy ignorant, a belief in callous and sensate plots, we call them plots, against the poor. You can still see how we figured it in any museum by looking up the caricatures of capital and labor that adorn the German and American socialistic papers of the old time. Book 1, Chapter 2, Section 2 I had cast Nettie off in an eloquent epistle, had really imagined the affair was over forever. I'm done with women, I said to Parlode, and then there was a silence for more than a week. Before that week was over, I was wondering, with a growing emotion, what would next happen between us. I found myself thinking constantly of Nettie, picturing her sometimes with stern satisfaction, sometimes with sympathetic remorse, mourning, regretting, realizing the absolute end that had come between us. At the bottom of my heart, I had no more believed that there was an end between us than that an end would come to the world. Had we not kissed one another, had we not achieved an atmosphere of whispering nearness, breached our virgin shyness with one another? Of course she was mine, of course I was hers, and separations and final quarrels and harshness and distance were no more than flourishes upon that eternal fact. So at least I felt the thing, however I shaped my thoughts. Whenever my imagination got to work, as that week drew to its close, she came in as a matter of course. I thought of her recurrently, all day, and dreamt of her at night. On Saturday night, I dreamt of her very vividly. Her face was flushed and wet with tears, her hair a little disordered, and when I spoke to her, she turned away. In some manner, this dream left in my mind a feeling of distress and anxiety. In the morning, I had a raging thirst to see her. That Sunday, my mother wanted me to go to church, very particularly. She had a double reason for that. She thought that it would certainly exercise a favorable influence upon my search for a situation throughout the next week, and in addition, Mr. Gabitas, with a certain mystery behind his glasses, had promised to see what he could do for me, and she wanted to keep him up to that promise. I half consented, and then my desire for Nettie took hold of me. I told my mother I wasn't going to church, and set off about eleven to walk the seventeen miles to Chexhill. It greatly intensified the fatigue of that long tramp that the sole of my boot presently split at the toe, and after I had cut the flapping portion off, a nail worked through and began to torment me. However, the boot looked all right after that operation and gave no audible hint of my discomfort. I got some bread and cheese at a little inn on the way and was in Chexhill Park about four. I did not go by the road past the house and so round to the gardens, but cut over the crest beyond the second keeper's cottage along a path Nettie used to call her own. It was a mere deer track, it led up a miniature valley and through a pretty dell in which we had been accustomed to meet, and so through the hollies and along a narrow path close by the wall of the shrubbery to the gardens. In my memory, that walk through the park before I came upon Nettie stands out very vividly. The long tramp before it is foreshortened to a mere effect of dusty road and painful boot, but the bracken valley and sudden tumult of doubts and unwanted expectations that came to me stands out now as something significant, as something unforgettable, something essential to the meaning of all that followed. Where should I meet her? What would she say? I had asked these questions before and found an answer. Now they came again with a trail of fresh implications, and I had no answer for them at all. As I approached Nettie, she ceased to be the mere butt of my egotistical self-projection, the custodian of my sexual pride, and drew together and became over and above this a personality of her own, a personality and a mystery, a sphinx I had evaded only to meet again. I find a little difficulty in describing the quality of the old world lovemaking so that it may be understandable now. We young people had practically no preparation at all for the stir and emotions of adolescence. Towards the young, the world maintained a conspiracy of stimulating silences, there came no initiation. There were books, stories of a curiously conventional kind that insisted on certain qualities in every love affair and greatly intensified one's natural desire for them, perfect trust, perfect loyalty, lifelong devotion. Much of the complex essentials of love were altogether hidden. One read these things, got accidental glimpses of this and that, wandered and forgot, and so one grew. 
Then strange emotions, novel alarming desires, dreams strangely charged with feeling, an inexplicable impulse of self-abandonment began to tickle queerly amongst the familiar purely egotistical and materialistic things of boyhood and girlhood. We were like misguided travelers who had camped in the dry bed of a tropical river. Presently, we were knee-deep and neck-deep in the flood. Our beings were suddenly going out from ourselves, seeking other beings, we knew not why. This novel craving for abandonment to someone of the other sex bore us away. We were ashamed and full of desire. We kept the thing a guilty secret and were resolved to satisfy it against all the world. In this state, it was we drifted in the most accidental way against some other blindly seeking creature and linked like nascent atoms. We were obsessed by the books we read and by all the talk about us that once we had linked ourselves, we were linked for life. Then afterwards we discovered that other was also an egotism, a thing of ideas and impulses that failed to correspond with ours. So it was, I say, with the young of my class and most of the young people in our world, so it came about that I sought Nettie on the Sunday afternoon and suddenly came upon her, light-bodied, slenderly feminine, hazel-eyed, with her soft, sweet young face under the shady brim of her hat of straw, the pretty Venus I had resolved should be wholly and exclusively mine. There, all unaware of me still, she stood, my essential feminine, the embodiment of the inner thing in life for me, and moreover, an unknown other, a person like myself. She held a little book in her hand, open as if she were walking along and reading it. That chanced to be her pose, but indeed she was quite standing still, looking away towards the grey and lichenous shrubbery wall, and as I think now, listening, her lips were a little apart, curved to that faint, sweet shadow of a smile. Book One Chapter 2, Section 3 I recall with a vivid precision her queer start when she heard the rustle of my approaching feet, her surprise, her eyes almost full of dismay for me. I could recollect, I believe, every significant word she spoke during our meeting, and most of what I said to her. At least it seems I could, though indeed I may deceive myself. But I will not make the attempt. We were both too ill-educated to speak our full meanings. We stamped out our feelings with clumsy, stereotyped phrases. You who are better, taught, would fail to catch our intention. The effect would be inanity. But our first words I may give you, because though they conveyed nothing to me at the time, afterwards they meant much. You, Willie, she said. I have come. I said, forgetting in the instant all the elaborate things I had intended to say. I thought I would surprise you. Surprise me? Yes. She stared at me for a moment. I can see her pretty face now as it looked at me, her impenetrable, dear face. She laughed a queer little laugh, and her color went for a moment, and then so soon as she had spoken came back again. Surprise me at what? She said with a rising note. I was too intent to explain myself to think of what might lie in that. I wanted to tell you, I said, that I didn't mean quite the things I put in my letter. Book 1, Chapter 2, Section 4 When I and Nettie had been sixteen, we had been just of an age and contemporaries altogether. Now we were a year and three quarters older. And she, her metamorphosis was almost complete, and I was still only at the beginning of a man's long adolescence. In an instant she grasped the situation. The hidden motives of her quick, ripened little mind flashed out their intuitive scheme of action. She treated me with that neat perfection of understanding, as a young woman has for a boy. But how did you come? she asked. I told her I had walked. Walked? In an instant, she was leading me towards the gardens. I must be tired. I must come home with her at once and sit down. Indeed, it was near tea time. The stewards had tea at the old-fashioned hour of five. Everyone would be so surprised to see me. Fancy walking, fancy. But she supposed a man thought nothing of seventeen miles. When could I have started? All the while, keeping me at a distance without even the touch of her hand. But, Nettie, I came over to talk to you. 
My dear boy, tea first, if you please. And besides, aren't we talking? The dear boy was a new note that sounded oddly to me. She quickened her pace a little. I wanted to explain, I began. Whatever I wanted to explain, I had no chance to do so. I said a few discrepant things that she answered rather by her intonation than her words. When we were well past the shrubbery, she slackened a little in her urgency. And so we came along the slope under the beeches to the garden. She kept her bright, straightforward-looking girlish eyes on me as we went. It seemed she did so all the time, but now I know, better than I did then, that every now and then she glanced over me and behind me towards the shrubbery. And all the while, behind her quick, breathless, inconsecutive talk, she was thinking. Her dress marked the end of her transition. Can I recall it? Not, I am afraid, in the terms a woman would use, but her bright brown hair, which had once flowed down her back in a jolly pigtail, tied with a bit of scarlet ribbon, was now caught up into an intricacy of pretty curves about her little ear and cheek, and the soft long lines of her neck, her white dress had descended to her feet. Her slender waist, which had once been a mere geographical expression, an imaginary line like the equator, was now a thing of flexible beauty. A year ago she had been a pretty girl's face sticking out from a little unimportant frock that carried upon an extremely active and efficient pair of brown stockinged legs. Now there was coming a strange new body that flowed beneath her clothes with a sinuous insistence. Every movement, and particularly the novel droop of her hand and arm to the unaccustomed skirts she gathered about her, and a graceful forward inclination that had come to her called softly to my eyes. A very fine scarf, I suppose you would call it a scarf, of green gossamer, that some new wakened instinct had told her to fling about her shoulders, clung now closely to the young undulations of her body, and now streamed fluttering out for a moment in a breath of wind, like some shy, independent tentacle, with a secret to impart, came into momentary contact with my arm. She caught it back and reproved it. We went through the green gate and the high garden wall. I held it open for her to pass through, for this was one of my restricted stock of stiff politenesses, and then for a second she was near touching me. So we came to the trim array of flower beds near the head gardener's cottage and the vistas of glass on our left. We walked between the box edgings and beds of begonias and into the shadow of a yew hedge within twenty yards of that very pond with the goldfish, at whose brim we had plighted our vows, and so we came to the wisteria-smothered porch. The door was wide open, and she walked in before me. "'Guess who has come to see us?' she cried. Her father answered indistinctly from the parlor, and a chair creaked. I judged he was disturbed in his nap. "'Mother!' she called in her young voice. "'Puss!' Puss was her sister. She told them in a marveling key that I had walked all the way from Clayton, and they gathered about me and echoed her notes of surprise. "'You'd better sit down, Willie,' said her father. "'Now you have got here, how's your mother?' He looked at me curiously as he spoke. He was dressed in his Sunday clothes, a sort of brownish tweeds, but the waistcoat was unbuttoned for greater comfort in his slumbers. He was a brown-eyed, ruddy man, and I still have now in my mind the bright effect of the red golden hairs that started out from his cheek to flow down into his beard. He was short but strongly built, and his beard and moustache were the biggest things about him. He had taken all the possibility of beauty he possessed, his clear skin, his bright hazel brown eyes, and wedded them to a certain quickness she got from her mother. Her mother, I remember as a sharp-eyed woman of great activity. She seems to me now to have been perpetually bringing in or taking out meals or doing some such service, and to me, for my mother's sake and my own, she was always welcoming and kind. Puss was a youngster of fourteen, perhaps, of whom a hard, bright stare and a pale skin like her mother's are the chief traces on my memory. All these people were very kind to me, and among them there was a common recognition, sometimes very agreeably finding expression, that I was clever. They all stood about me as if they were a little at a loss. Sit down, said her father. Give him a chair, Puss. We talked a little stiffly. They were evidently surprised by my sudden apparition dusty, fatigued, and white-faced, but Nettie did not remain to keep the conversation going. There, she cried suddenly, as if she were vexed, I declare, and she darted out of the room. Lord, what a girl it is, said Miss Stewart. I don't know what's come to her. It was half an hour before Nettie came back. It seemed a long time to me, and yet she had been running. 
for when she came in she was out of breath. In the meantime, I had thrown out casually that I had given up my place at Rawdon's. I can do better than that, I said. I left my book in the dell, she said, panting. Is tea ready? And that was her apology. We didn't shake down into comfort, even with the coming of the tea things. Tea at the gardener's cottage was a serious meal, with a big cake and little cakes, and preserves and fruit, a fine spread upon a table. You must imagine me, sullen, awkward, and preoccupied, perplexed by the something that was inexplicably unexpected in Nettie, saying little and glowering across the cake at her, and all the eloquence I had been concentrating for the previous twenty-four hours miserably lost somewhere in the back of my mind. Nettie's father tried to set me talking. He had a liking for my gift of ready speech, for his own ideas came with difficulty, and it pleased and astonished him to hear me pouring out my views. Indeed, over there I was, I think, even more talkative than with Parload. Though to the world at large, I was a shy young lout. You ought to write it for the newspapers, he used to say. That's what you ought to do. I never heard such nonsense. Or, you've got the gift of the gab, young man. We ought to have made a lawyer of you. But that afternoon, even in his eyes, I didn't shine. Failing any other stimulus, he reverted to my search for a situation, but even that did not engage me. Book 1, Chapter 2, Section 5 For a long time I feared I should have to go back to Clayton without another word to Nettie. She seemed insensible to the need I felt for a talk with her, and I was thinking even of a sudden demand for that before them all. It was a transparent maneuver of her mother's, who had been watching my face, that sent us out at last together to do something. I forget now what, in one of the greenhouses, whatever that little mission may have been, it was the merest, most barefaced excuse, a door to shut, or a window to close, and I don't think it got done. Nettie hesitated and obeyed. She led the way through one of the hothouses. It was a low, steamy, brick-floored alley between staging that bore a close crowd of pots and ferns, and behind big branching plants that were spread and nailed overhead so as to make an impervious cover of leaves. And in that close, green privacy, she stopped and turned on me suddenly like a creature at bay. "'Isn't the maidenhair fern lovely?' she said, and looked at me with eyes that said, "'Now. Nettie, I began, I was a fool to write you as I did.' She startled me by the ascent that flashed out upon her face, but she said nothing and stood waiting. Nettie, I plunged, I can't do without you. I I love you. If you loved me, she said trimly, watching the white fingers she plunged among the green branches of the Seligonella, could you write the things you do to me? I don't mean them, I said, at least not always. I thought really they were very good letters, and that Nettie was stupid to think otherwise, but I was for the moment clearly aware of the impossibility of conveying that to her. You wrote them. But then I tramped seventeen miles to say I don't mean them. Yes, but perhaps you do. I think I was at a loss. Then I said, not very clearly, I don't. You think you, you love me, Willie, but you don't. I do, Nettie, you know I do. For answer, she shook her head. I made what I thought was a most heroic plunge. Nettie, I said, I'd rather have you than, than my own opinions. The Salaganella still engaged her. You think so now, she said. I broke out into protestations. No, she said shortly, it's different now. But why should two letters make such a difference, I said. It isn't only the letters, but it is different. It's different for good. She halted a little with that sentence, seeking her expression. She looked up abruptly into my eyes and moved, indeed slightly but with the intimation that she thought our talk might end. But I did not mean it to end like that. For good, said I. No, Nettie, Nettie, you don't mean that. I do, she said deliberately, still looking at me and with all her pose conveying her finality. She seemed to brace herself for the outbreak that must follow. Of course, I became wordy, but I did not submerge her. She stood entrenched, firing her contradictions like guns into my scattered discourse of attack, I remember that our talk took the absurd form of disputing whether I could be in love with her or not, and there was I, present in evidence, in a deepening and widening distress of soul because she could stand there, defensive, brighter and prettier than ever, and in some inexplicable way cut off from me and inaccessible. 
You know, we had never been together before without little enterprises of endearment, without a faintly guilty, quite delightful excitement. I pleaded, I argued, I tried to show that even my harsh and difficult letters came from my desire to come wholly into contact with her. I made exaggerated fine statements of the longing I felt for her when I was away, of the shock and misery of finding her estranged and cool. She looked at me, feeling the emotion of my speech and impervious to its ideas. I had no doubt, whatever poverty in my words, coolly written down now, that I was eloquent then. I meant most intensely what I said, indeed I was wholly concentrated upon it. I was set upon conveying to her with absolute sincerity my sense of distance and the greatness of my desire. I toiled toward her painfully and obstinately through a jungle of words. Her face changed very slowly, by such imperceptible degrees as when, at dawn light, comes into a clear sky. I could feel that I touched her, that her hardness was in some manner melting, her determination softening toward hesitations. The habit of an old familiarity lurked somewhere within her, but she would not let me reach her. No, she cried abruptly, starting into motion. She laid a hand on my arm. A wonderful new friendliness came into her voice. It's impossible, Willie. Everything is different now, everything. We made a mistake. We two young sillies made a mistake, and everything is different forever. Yes, yes. She turned about. Nettie, cried I, and still protesting, pursued her along the narrow alley between the staging toward the hothouse door. I pursued her like an accusation, and she went before me like one who is guilty and ashamed, so I recall it now. She would not let me talk to her again. Yet I could see that my talk to her had altogether abolished the clear-cut distance of our meeting in the park. Ever and again I found her hazel eyes upon me. They expressed something novel, a surprise, as though she realized an unwanted relationship and a sympathetic pity. And still, something defensive. When we got back to the cottage, I fell talking, rather more freely, with her father about the nationalization of railways, and my spirits and temper had so far mended at the realization that I could still produce an effect upon Nettie, that I was even playful with Puss. Mrs. Stewart judged from that that things were better with me than they were, and began to beam mightily. But Nettie remained thoughtful and said very little. She was lost in perplexities I could not fathom, and presently she slipped away from us and went upstairs. Book 1, Chapter 2, Section 6 I was, of course, too footsore to walk back to Clayton, but I had a shilling and a penny in my pocket for the train between Chex Hill and Two Mile Stone, and that much of the distance I proposed to do in the train. And when I got ready to go, Nettie amazed me by waking up the most remarkable solicitude for me. I must, she said, go by the road. It was altogether too dark for a short way to the lodge gates. I pointed out that it was moonlight, with the comet thrown in, said old steward. No, she insisted, you must go by the road. I still disputed. She was standing near me, to please me, she urged, in a quick undertone, and with a persuasive look that puzzled me. Even in the moment, I asked myself why should this please her. I might have agreed had she not followed up with that, the hollies by the shrubbery are as dark as pitch, and there's the deer hounds. I'm not afraid of the dark, said I, nor of the deer hounds either. But those dogs, supposing one was loose. That was a girl's argument, a girl who still had to understand that fear is an overt argument only for her own sex. I thought, too, of those grisly lank brutes straining at their chains in the choir they could make of a night when they heard belated footsteps along the edge of the killing wood, and the thought banished my wish to please her. Like most imaginative natures, I was acutely capable of dreads and retreats, and constantly occupied with their suppression and concealment, and to refuse the shortcut when it might appear that I did it on account of half a dozen almost certainly chained dogs was impossible. So I set off in spite of her, feeling valiant and glad to be so easily brave, but a little sorry that she should think herself crossed by me. A thin cloud veiled the moon, and the way under the beaches was dark and indistinct. I was not so preoccupied with my love affairs as to neglect what I will confess was always my custom at night across the wild and lonely park. I made myself a club by fastening a big flint to one end with my twisted handkerchief and tying the other about my wrist, and with this in my pocket went on comforted. 
and it chanced that as I emerged from the hollies by the corner of the shrubbery, I was startled to come unexpectedly upon a young man in evening dress smoking a cigar. I was walking on turf, so that the sound I made was slight. He stood clear in the moonlight, his cigar glowed like a blood-red star, and it did not occur to me that at the time I advanced towards him almost invisibly in an impenetrable shadow. Hello, he cried, with a sort of amiable challenge. I'm here first. I came out into the light. Who cares if you are, said I. I had jumped at once to an interpretation of his words. I knew that there was an intermittent dispute between the house people and the villager public about the use of this track, and it is needless to say where my sympathies fell in that dispute. Eh? he cried in surprise. Thought I would run away, I suppose, said I, and came up close to him. All my enormous hatred of his class had flared up at the sight of his costume, at the fancied challenge of his words. I knew him. He was Edward Verrall, son of the man who owned not only this great estate, but more than half of Rawdon's pot bank, and who had interest and possessions, collieries and rent, all over the district of the four towns. He was a gallant youngster, people said, and very clever. Young as he was, there was talk of Parliament for him. He had been a great success at the university, and he was being sedulously popularized among us. He took with a light confidence, as a matter of course, advantages that I would have faced the rack to get, and I firmly believed myself a better man than he. He was, as he stood there, a concentrated figure of all that filled me with bitterness. One day he had stopped in a motor outside our house, and I remember the thrill of rage which I had noted, the dutiful admiration in my mother's eyes as she peered through her blind at him. That's young Mr. Verrall, she said. They say he's very clever. They would, I answered. Damn them and him. But that is, by the way. He was clearly astonished to find himself face to face with the man. His note changed. Who the devil are you? he asked. My retort was the cheap expedient of re-echoing. Who the devil are you? Well, he said. I'm coming along this path if I like, I said. See, it's a public path, just as this used to be public land. You've stolen the land, you and yours, and now you want to steal the right of way. You'll ask us to get off the face of the earth next, and I shan't oblige. See? I was shorter, and I suppose a couple years younger than he, but I had the improvised club in my pocket gripped ready, and I would have fought with him very cheerfully. But he fell a step backward as I came toward him. Socialist, I presume, he said, alert and quiet and with the faintest note of badinage. One of many. We're all socialists nowadays, he remarked philosophically, and I haven't the faintest intention of disputing your right of way. You'd better not, I said. No. No. He replaced his cigar and there was a brief pause. Catching a train, he threw out. It seemed absurd not to answer. Yes, I said shortly. He said it was a pleasant evening for a walk. I hovered for a moment, and there was my path before me, and he stood aside. There seemed nothing to do but go on. Good night, said he. As that intention took effect, I growled a surly good night. I felt like a bombshell of swearing that must presently burst with some violence as I went on my silent way. He had so completely got the best of our encounter. Book 1 Chapter 2, Section 7 There comes a memory, an odd intermixture of two entirely divergent things that stands out with the intensest vividness. As I went across the last open meadow, following the shortcut to Chexhill Station, I perceived I had two shadows. The thing jumped into my mind and stopped its tumid flow for a moment. I remember the intelligent detachment of my sudden interest. I turned sharply and stood looking at the moon and the great white comet that drift out of the clouds had now rather suddenly unveiled. The comet was perhaps twenty degrees from the moon. What a wonderful thing it looked floating there, a greenish-white apparition in the dark blue deeps. It looked brighter than the moon because it was smaller, but the shadow it cast, though clearer cut, was much fainter than the moon's shadow. I went on noting these facts, watching my two shadows precede me, I am totally unable to account for the sequence of my thoughts on this occasion, but suddenly, as if I had come on this new fact round a corner, the comet was out of my mind again, and I was face to face with an absolutely new idea. I wonder sometimes if the two shadows I cast, one with a sort of feminine faintness with regard to the other, and not quite so tall, 
may not have suggested the word or the thought of an assignation to my mind. All that I have clear is that with the certitude of intuition, I knew what it was that had brought the youth in evening dress outside the shrubbery. Of course, he had come to meet Nettie. Once the mental process was started, it took no time at all. The day which had been full of perplexities for me, the mysterious invisible thing that had held Nettie and myself apart, the unaccountable strange something in her manner was revealed and explained. I knew now why she had looked guilty at my appearance, what had brought her out that afternoon, why she had hurried me in, the nature of the book she had run back to fetch, the reason why she had wanted me to go back by the high road, and why she had pitied me. It was all in the instant clear to me. You must imagine me, a black little creature, suddenly stricken still, for a moment standing rigid, and then again suddenly becoming active with an impotent gesture, becoming audible with an inarticulate cry, with two little shadows mocking my dismay, and about this figure you must conceive a great wide space of moonlit grass, rimmed by the looming suggestion of distant trees, trees very low and faint and dim, and over it all the dome serenity of that wonderful luminous night. For a little while, this realization stunned my mind. My thoughts came to a pause, staring at my discovery. Meanwhile, my feet and my previous direction carried me through the warm darkness to Chexhill Station, with its little lights, to the ticket office window, and so to the train. I remember myself, as it were, waking up to the thing. I was alone in one of the dingy third-class compartments of that time, and the sudden nearly frantic insurgence of my rage. I stood up with the cry of an angry animal and smote my fist with all my strength against the panel of wood before me. Curiously enough, I have completely forgotten my mood after that for a little while, but I know that later, for a minute perhaps, I hung out for a time out of the carriage with the door open, contemplating a leap from the train. It was to be a dramatic leap, and then I would go storming back to her, denounce her, overwhelm her, and I hung, urging myself to do it. I don't remember how it was decided not to do this at last, but in the end I didn't. When the train stopped at the next station, I had given up all my thoughts of going back. I was sitting in the corner of the carriage with my bruised and wounded hand pressed under my arm, and still insensible to its pain, trying to think out clearly a scheme of action, action that should express the monstrous indignation that possessed me. Book 1, Chapter 3, The Revolver Section 1 That comet is going to hit the earth. So said one of the two men who got into the train and settled down. Ah, said the other man. They do say that it is made of gas, that comet. We shan't blow up, shall us? What did it matter to me? I was thinking of revenge. Revenge against the primary conditions of my being. I was thinking of Nettie and her lover. I was firmly resolved he should not have her. Though, I had to kill them both to prevent it. I did not care what else might happen. If only that end was ensured... All my thwarted passions had turned to rage. I would have accepted eternal torment that night without a second thought to be certain of revenge. A hundred possibilities of actions, a hundred stormy situations, a whirl of violent schemes chased one another through my shamed, exasperated mind. The sole prospect I could endure was of some gigantic, inexorably cruel vindication of my humiliated self. And Nettie? I love Nettie still, but now with the intensest jealousy, with the keen, unmeasuring hatred of wounded pride and baffled, passionate desire. Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 2 As I came down the hill from Clayton Crest, for my shilling and a penny only permitted my travelling by train as far as two milestone, and thence I had to walk over the hill. I remember very vividly a little man with a shrill voice who was preaching under a gas lamp against a hoarding to a thin crowd of Sunday evening loafers. He was a short man, bald, with a little fair curly beard and hair and watery blue eyes, and he was preaching that the end of the world drew near. I think that is the first time I heard anyone link the comet with the end of the world. He had got that jumbled up with the international politics and prophecies from the book of Daniel. I stopped to hear him, only for a moment or so. 
I do not think I should have halted at all, but this crowd blocked my path, and the sight of his queer, wild expression, the gesture of his upward-pointing finger held me. There is the end of all your sins and follies, he bawled. There, there is the star of judgments, the judgments of the Most High God. It is appointed unto all men to die, unto all men to die. His voice changed to a curious flat chant, and after death, the judgment, the judgment. I pushed and threaded my way through the bystanders and went on, and his curious, harsh, flat voice pursued me. I went on with the thoughts that had preoccupied me before, where I could buy a revolver, and how I might master its use, and probably I should have forgotten all about him, had he not taken part in a hideous dream that ended the little sleep I had that night. For the most part, I lay awake, thinking of Nettie and her lover. Then came three strange days, three days that seemed now to have been wholly concentrated upon one business. This dominant business was the purchase of my revolver. I held myself resolutely to the idea that I must either restore myself by some extraordinary act of vigor and violence in Nettie's eyes, or I must kill her. I would not let myself fall away from that. I felt that if I let this matter pass, my last shred of pride and honor would pass with it, that for the rest of my life I should never deserve the slightest respect or any woman's love. Pride kept me to my purpose between my gusts of passion, yet it was not so easy to buy that revolver. I had a kind of shyness of the moment when I should have to face the shopman, and I was particularly anxious to have a story ready if he should see fit to ask questions why I bought such a thing. I determined to say I was going to Texas, and thought it might prove useful there. Texas in those days had the reputation of a wild, lawless land. As I knew nothing of caliber or impact, I wanted also to be able to ask with a steady face at what distance a man or woman could be killed by the weapon that might be offered me. I was pretty cool-headed in relation to such practical aspects of my affair. I had some little difficulty in finding a gunsmith. In Clayton, there were some rook rifles and so forth in a cycle shop, but the only revolvers these people had impressed me as being too small and toy-like for my purpose. It was in a pawn shop window in the narrow high street of Swathinglea that I found my choice, a reasonably clumsy and serious-looking implement ticketed as used in the American Army. I had drawn out my balance from the savings bank, matter of two pounds and more to make this purchase, and I found it at last a very easy transaction. The pawnbroker told me where I could get ammunition and I went home that night with bulging pockets and armed men. The purchase of my revolver was, I say, the chief business of those days, but you must not think I was so intent upon it as to be insensible to the stirring things that were happening in the streets through which I went seeking the means to effect my purpose. They were full of murmurings, the whole region of the four towns scowled, lowering from its narrow doors, the ordinary healthy flow of people going to work, people going about their business, was chilled and checked. Numbers of men stood about the streets in knots and groups, as corpuscles gather and catch in the blood vessels in the opening stages of inflammation. The woman looked haggard and worried. The iron workers had refused the proposed reduction of their wages, and the lockout had begun. They were already at play. The conciliation board was doing its best to keep the coal miners and masters from a breach, but young Lord Redcar, the greatest of our coal owners and landlord of all Swathinglea and half Clayton, was taking a fine, upstanding attitude that made the breach inevitable. He was a handsome young man, a gallant young man, his pride revolted at the idea of being dictated by a lot of bally miners, and he meant, he said, to make a fight for it. The world had treated him sumptuously from his earliest years. The shares in the common stock of 5,000 people had gone to pay for his handsome upbringing and large, romantic, expensive ambitions filled his generously nurtured mind. He had early distinguished himself at Oxford by his scornful attitudes towards democracy. There was something that appealed to the imagination in his fine antagonism to the crowd. On the one hand was the brilliant young nobleman, picturesquely alone and on the other, the ugly, inexpressible multitude, dressed inelegantly in shop clothes, undereducated, underfed, envious, base, and with a wicked disinclination for work and a wicked appetite for the good things it could so rarely get. For common, imaginative purposes, one left out the policeman from the design, the stalwart policeman protecting his lordship, 
and ignored the fact that while Lord Redcar had his hands immediately and legally on the workman's shelter and bread, they could touch him to the skin only by some violent breach of the law. He lived at Lowchester House, five miles or so beyond Chex Hill, but partly to show how little he cared for his antagonists and partly no doubt to keep himself in touch with the negotiations that were still going on, he was visible almost every day in and about the four towns, driving that big motor car of his that could take him 60 miles an hour. The English passion for fair play one might have thought sufficient to rob this bold procedure of any dangerous possibilities, but he did not go altogether free from insult, and on one occasion at least an intoxicated Irish woman shook her fist at him. A dark, quiet crowd that was greater each day, a crowd more than half women, brooded as a cloud will sometimes brood permanently upon a mountain crest, in the marketplace outside the Clayton Town Hall where the conference was held. I consider myself justified in regarding Lord Redcar's passing automobile with a special animosity because of the leaks in our roof. We held our little house on lease. The owner was a mean, saving old man named Pettigrew, who lived in a villa adorned with plaster images of dogs and goats at Overcastle, and in spite of our specific agreement, he would do no repairs for us at all. He rested secure in my mother's timidity. Once long ago, she had been behind hand with her rent, with half of her quarter's rent, and he had extended the days of grace a month. Her sense that some day she might need to ask the same mercy again made her his abject slave. She was afraid even to ask that he should cause the roof to be mended for fear he might take offense, but one night the rain poured in on her bed and gave her a cold, and stained and soaked her poor old patchwork counterpane. Then she got me to compose an excessively polite letter to old Pettigrew, begging him as a favor to perform his legal obligations. It is part of the general imbecility of those days that such one-sided law as existed was a profound mystery to the common people. Its provisions impossible to ascertain, its machinery impossible to set in motion. Instead of the clearly written code, the lucid statements of rules and principles that are now at the service of everyone. The law was the muddle secret of the legal profession. Poor people, overworked people, had constantly to submit to petty wrongs because of the intolerable uncertainty not only of law but of cost, and of the demands upon time and energy proceedings might make. There was indeed no justice for anyone too poor to command a good solicitor's deference and loyalty. There was nothing but rough police protection and the magistrate's grudging or eccentric advice for the mass of the population. The civil law, in particular, was a mysterious upper-class weapon, and I can imagine no injustice that would have been sufficient to induce my poor old mother to appeal to it. All this begins to sound incredible, I can only assure you that it was so. But I, when I learned that old Pettigrew had been down to tell my mother all about his rheumatism to inspect the roof and to allege that nothing was needed, gave way to my most frequent emotion in those days, a burning indignation, and took the matter into my own hands. I wrote and asked him, with a withering air of technicality to have the roof repaired as per agreement, and added, if not done in one week, from now we shall be obliged to take proceedings. I had not mentioned this high line of conduct to my mother at first, and so when old Pettigrew came down in a state of great agitation with my letter in his hand, she was almost equally agitated. How could you write to old Mr. Pettigrew like that? she asked me. I said that old Pettigrew was a shameful old rascal, or words to that effect, and I am afraid I behaved in a very undutiful way to her when she said that she had settled everything with him. She wouldn't say how, but I could guess well enough, and that I was to promise her, promise her faithfully, to do nothing more in the matter. I wouldn't promise her. And, having nothing better to employ me then, I presently went to raging old Pettigrew in order to put the whole thing before him in what I considered the proper light. Old Pettigrew evaded my illumination. He saw me coming up his front steps. I can still see his queer old nose and the wrinkled brow over his eye and the little wisp of gray hair that showed over the corner of his window blind, and he instructed his servant to put up the chain when she answered the door and to tell me that he would not see me. So I had to fall back upon my pen. Then it was, as I had no idea 
what were the proper proceedings to take, the brilliant idea occurred to me of appealing to Lord Redcar as the ground landlord, and, as it were, our feudal chief, and pointing out to him that his security for his rent was depreciating in old Pettigrew's hands, I added some general observations on leaseholds, the taxation of ground rents, and the private ownership of the soil. And Lord Redcar, whose spirit revolted at democracy, and who cultivated a pert, humiliating manner with his inferiors to show as much, earned my distinguished hatred forever by causing his secretary to present his compliments to me, and his request that I would mind my own business and leave him to manage his. At which I was so greatly enraged that I first tore this note into a minute innumerable pieces, and then dashed it dramatically all over the floor of my room from which, to keep my mother from the job, I afterward had to pick it up laboriously on all fours. I was still meditating a tremendous retort, an indictment of all Lord Redcar's class, their manners, morals, economic and political crimes, when my trouble with Nettie arose to swamp all minor troubles. Yet not so completely but that I snarled aloud when his lordship's motor car whizzed by me as I went out upon my long, meandering quest for a weapon and I discovered after a time that my mother had bruised her knee and was lame. Fearing to irritate me by bringing the thing before me again, she had set herself to move her bed out of the way of the drip without my help, and she had knocked her knee. All her poor furnishings, I discovered, were cowering now close to the peeling bedroom walls. There had come a vast discoloration of the ceiling, and the washing tub was in occupation of the middle of her chamber." It is necessary that I should set these things before you, should give the key of inconvenience and uneasiness in which all things were arranged, should suggest the breath of trouble that stirred along the hot summer streaks, the anxiety about the strike, the rumors and indignations, the gatherings and meetings, the increasing gravity of the policemen's faces, the combative headlines of the local papers, the knots of picketers who scrutinized anyone who passed near the silent smokeless forges, but in my mind, you must understand, such impressions came and went irregularly. They made a moving background, changing undertones to my preoccupation by that dark, shaping purpose to which a revolver was so imperative and essential. Along the darkling streets amidst the sullen crowds, the thought of Nettie, my Nettie, and her gentleman lover made ever a vivid inflammatory spot of purpose in my brain. Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 3 It was three days after this, on Wednesday, that is to say, that the first of those sinister outbreaks occurred that ended in the bloody affair of Peacock Grove and the flooding out of the entire line of the swathing Leah collieries. It was the only one of these disturbances I was destined to see, and at most a mere trivial preliminary of that struggle. The accounts that have been written of this affair vary very widely. To read them is to realize the extraordinary carelessness of truth that dishonored the press of those latter days. In my bureau, I have several files of the daily papers of the old time. I collected them, as a matter of fact, and three or four of about that date I have just this moment taken out and looked through to refresh my impression of what I saw. They lie before me, queer, shriveled, incredible things. The cheap paper has already become brittle and brown and split along the creases, the ink faded or smeared, and I have to handle them with the utmost care when I glance among their raging headlines. As I sit here in this serene place, their quality throughout, their arrangement, their tone, their arguments and exhortations, read as though they come from drugged and drunken men. They give one the effect of faded bawling of screams and shouts heard faintly in a little gramophone. It is only on Monday, I find, and buried deep below the war news, that these publications contain any intimation that unusual happenings were forward in Clayton and Swathing Leah. What I saw was towards evening. I had been learning to shoot with my new possession. I had walked out with it four or five miles across the patch of moorland and down to a secluded little coppice full of blue bells, halfway along the high road between Leet and Stafford. Here I had spent the afternoon experimenting and practicing with careful deliberation and grim persistence. I had brought an old kite frame of cane with me that folded and unfolded, and each shot hole I made I marked and numbered to compare with my other endeavors. At last I was satisfied that I could hit a playing card at thirty paces nine times out of ten. The light was getting too bad for me to see my penciled bullseyes. 
In that state of quiet moodiness that sometimes comes with hunger to passionate men, I returned by the way of swathing Leah towards my home. The road I followed came down between banks of wretched-looking working men's houses and closed packed rows on either side, and took upon itself the role of swathing Leah High Street, where, at a lamp and a pillar box, the steam trams began. So far, that dirty, hot way had been unusually quiet and empty. But beyond the corner, where the first group of beer shops clustered, it became populous. It was very quiet still, even the children were a little inactive. But there were a lot of people standing dispersedly in little groups, and with a general direction towards the gates of the Bantic Burden Coal Pit. The place was being picketed, although at that time the miners were still nominally at work, and the conferences between masters and men still in session at Clayton Town Hall, But one of the men employed at the Bantic Burden Pit, Jack Briscoe, was a socialist, and he had distinguished himself by a violent letter upon the crisis to the leading socialistic paper in England, the Clarion, in which he had ventured among the motives of Lord Redcar. The publication of this had been followed by instant dismissal, as Lord Redcar wrote a day or so later to the Times, I have that Times, I have all the London papers of the last month before the change. The man was paid off and kicked out. Any self-respecting employer would do the same. The thing had happened overnight, and the men did not at once take a clear line upon what was, after all, a very intricate and debatable occasion. But they came out in a sort of semi-official strike from all Lord Redcar's collieries beyond the canal that besets Swathing Leah. They did so without formal notice, committing a breach of contract by this sudden cessation. But in the long labor struggles of the old days, the workers were constantly putting themselves in the wrong and committing illegalities through that overpowering craving for dramatic promptness natural to uneducated minds. All the men had not come out of the Bantic Burden Pit. Something was wrong there, an indecision if nothing else. The mine was still working, and there was a rumor that men from Durham had been held in readiness by Lord Redcar and were already in the mine. Now it is absolutely impossible to ascertain certainly how things stood at that time. The newspapers say this and that, but nothing trustworthy remains. I believe I should have gone striding athwart the dark stage of that stagnant industrial drama without asking a question, if Lord Redcar had not chanced to come upon the scene about the same time as myself, and incontinently end its stagnation. He had promised that if the men wanted a struggle, he would put up the best fight they had ever had and he had been active all afternoon in meeting the quarrel halfway and preparing as conspicuously as possible for the scratched force of blacklegs, as we called them, who were, he said, and we believed, to replace the strikers in his pits. I was an eyewitness of the whole of the affair outside the Bantic Burden Pit, and I do not know what happened. Picture to yourself how the thing came to me. I was descending a steep, cobbled, excavated road between banked-up footways, perhaps six feet high, upon which, in a monotonous series, opened the living room doors of rows of dark, low cottages. The perspective of squat blue slate roofs and clustering chimneys drifted downward towards the irregular open space before the colliery, a space covered with coaly, wheel-scarred mud, with a patch of weedy dump to the left and the colliery gates to the right. Beyond, the high streets with shops resumed again in earnest and went on, and the lines of the steam tramway that started out from before my feet, and were here shining and acutely visible with reflected skylight, and here lost in a shadow, took up for one acute moment the greasy yellow irradiation of a newly lit gas lamp as they vanished round the bend. Beyond spread a darkling marsh of homes, an infinitude of little smoking hovels and emergent, meager churches, public houses, board schools, and other buildings amidst the prevailing chimneys of Swathing Leah. To the right, very clear and relatively high, the Bantic Burden pit mouth was marked by a gaunt lattice, bearing a great black wheel, very sharp and distinct in the twilight. And beyond, in an irregular perspective, were others following the lie of the seams, The general effect, as one came down the hill, was of a dark, compressed life between a very high and wide and luminous evening sky, against which these pit wheels rose, and ruling the calm spaciousness of that heaven was the great comet, now green-white and wonderful for all who had eyes to see. 
The fading afterglow of the sunset threw up all contours and skyline to the west, and the comet rose eastward out of the pouring tumult of smoke from Bladden's forges. The moon had still to rise. By this time, the comet had begun to assume the cloud-like form still familiar through the medium of a thousand photographs and sketches. At first, it had been an almost telescopic speck. It had brightened to the dimensions of the greatest star in the heavens. It had still grown hour by hour in its incredibly swift, its noiseless and inevitable rush upon our earth, until it had equaled and surpassed the moon. Now it was the most splendid thing the sky of earth has ever held. I have never seen a photograph that gave a proper idea of it. Never at any time did it assume the conventional tailed outline. Comets are supposed to have. Astronomers talked of its double tail, one preceding it and one trailing behind it, but these were foreshortened to nothing, so that it had rather the form of a bellying puff of luminous smoke with an intenser, brighter heart. It rose a hot yellow color and only began to show its distinctive greenness when it was clear of the mists of the evening.' 